So a very warm welcome to everybody joining us at home. And we'll begin with those responses. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. And so we say together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your law. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse you from your sin and restore you in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to keep a few moments of silence as we remember God's presence here with us. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Well, now we're going to sing together our first song of worship. It's on page nine in the song booklets, and it's holy is the Lord God Almighty.
reading this morning is from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 1, verses 22 to 28. And you can find it in the Blue Pew Bibles on page 831. Spread out above the heads of the living creatures was what looked like an expanse, sparkling like ice and awesome. Under the expanse their wings were stretched out one towards the other, and each had two wings covering its body. When the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings like the roar of rushing waters, like the voice of the Almighty, like the tumult of an army. When they stood still, they lowered their wings. Then there came a voice from above the expanse over their heads, as they stood with lowered wings. Above the expanse over their heads was what looked like a throne of sapphire, and high above the throne, high above on the throne, was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal, as if full of fire, and brilliant light surrounded him, like the appearance of a rainbow. In the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down, and I heard the voice of one speaking. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We pray that you would speak to us through it by your Holy Spirit. That you would give us understanding in our minds and joy in our hearts. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning we are continuing to look at this wonderful vision of God that is revealed to Ezekiel in this first chapter of the book. And to understand it we uh, can think back to the context here which we've seen in the last two weeks that Ezekiel is with those in exile, the exiles from Israel who have been deported unwillingly against their wishes to the plains of Babylon. Far from home and perhaps feeling far from God. But the sense of being abandoned, defeated, demoralised, powerless, forgotten, overlooked. And undoubtedly, there would be questions in their minds uh, that we might also echo when life is hard. Questions like, where is God in our experience? And when everything seems to go wrong, and when life doesn't go to plan, is God still in charge? Is he still trustworthy? Is he still on the throne, still ruling? Is he still glorious, deserving our worship? Is he still all that he's ever been in our lives when we are discouraged or downcast or feeling lost or stressed or anxious? In the gloomy, difficult times of life, can we hold on to our confidence in him. 
And for Ezekiel, for the exiles in Babylon, what God provides them with, and particularly Ezekiel, is this vision of his glory and splendour. Because when we're downcast, what we need more than anything is to lift up our eyes to see something of the glory of God. We need to focus less on our problems, less on our circumstances, perhaps even less on ourselves and more on him. To focus more on how wonderful he is, how sovereign and glorious and powerful and present and loving. And so for two weeks past we've been looking at this vision of God's glory. We've seen the awesome storm cloud with the living creatures within it. The storm that reminded us of God's presence and power and glory. And then last week we saw the living creatures with the, the wheels protect with eyes that reminded us that God is not limited. He can go wherever he wants, everywhere, and see everything. But now, in verses 22 to 28, we're coming to what may be the most important part of Ezekiel's vision. As he lifts his eyes to look above and beyond these angels, the cherubim, the living creatures. And that's exactly, of course, what the Bible urges us to do in Colossians, to fix our minds on things above. To look up, as it were. And so in these verses we can ask, what is it that is above the angels? What is it that Ezekiel hears and what does he see? And we'll answer that and then we'll ask what it all means for us. So do bear with me as we work through the vision. We will come to what it means for us, but we need to see uh, what Ezekiel sees. Uh, first, and indeed what he hears. So that's what we'll be asking. What does he hear, what does he see, and what does it mean? So, what does he see immediately above the angels? We'll look immediately and then further up. And verse 22 tells us what Ezekiel sees immediately above the angels. Spread out above the heads of the living creatures, was what looked like an expanse, sparkling like ice and awesome. There is this vast and wonderful ceiling of translucent crystal, glittering and, and shimmering. You can call it a ceiling, but a little later on we might call it a floor. It's all a matter of perspective. But there it is, almost like a barrier above the heads of the angels, very similar to that which Moses saw on Mount Sinai uh, when he saw the Lord. Ezekiel sees that, that expanse, but he also hears, he hears the sound of the wings of the angels moving. And it is described in verses 23 and 24 as a, a thunderous sound. In fact, Ezekiel uses three different descriptions of it in verse 24. When the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings, firstly like the roar of rushing waters. Think of a, a vast waterfall or perhaps a flood or a river in in, um, in, a, in a torrent. Thunderous is a good description of it. And then the second image, or the third image actually, is that of the tumult of an army. Imagine a, a vast array of people marching in step to war. Again, a, the thunder of their footsteps, or a huge crowd heading towards some vast event, the Commonwealth Games, or, the, or a concert, or a football match. You can almost imagine the ground trembling 
as the crowd moved. So like rushing waters, like a mighty crowd, or thirdly, like the voice of the Almighty, which elsewhere the Bible tells us sounds like thunder. Remember the baptism of Jesus, there was a voice saying, this is my son with whom I am well pleased, and the crowd thought that it thundered. Each of these images is just trying to convey the sense of a, a sound that is loud and overpowering and awesome. Like thunder, like a mighty crowd, like an army, like a waterfall, like the voice of the Almighty, but it's not the voice of the Almighty. It is just the sound of the wings of the angels below this ceiling. And if we want to hear the voice of the Almighty, then we have to look a little further on, even higher up. Which is what Ezekiel does. He hears the sound of the angels. He sees this crystal ceiling and then he looks beyond it. And again, we can ask, what does he see? And what does he hear further up and beyond? And we come to the voice of the Almighty itself in verse 25. Then there came a voice from above the expanse over their heads as they stood with lowered wings. And at this point we're given little by way of description of the voice. But Ezekiel does try and describe what he sees. And what he sees is the throne and the one who sits upon it. The throne is there in verse 26. Above the expanse over their heads was what looked like a throne of sapphire. Imagine this vast blue crystal throne. So we can, if in our mind's eye, if you like, hear the sound of the angels, hear the voice of the Almighty, see the throne above it. And then we come to the one on the throne. And Ezekiel tries to put into words his glimpse of the glory of the living God. And it is no surprise that words inevitably fall short. How can we possibly try and describe the glory of God? It is inevitably beyond our capacity to grasp. It's too great, too glorious, too wonderful for us. But as Ezekiel tries, and he gives at least four tentative descriptions of what he sees. And we must remember these are just efforts to describe the indescribable. And so what is it like? What is the figure on the throne as he appears to Ezekiel? Four little descriptions. We see it in verses 27 and 28. He appears to be like superheated metal. Imagine metal in a forge that is white hot and glowing. It's like fire, a very similar image. It's like light in its most intense brilliance. And then finally, the fourth description is the one that I really like the most. Not that it's a competition to choose. But in verse 28, we're told that the, this image of the one on the throne it's like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day. A sense there of the, the beauty of the colours of the glory of the Lord. Whenever I see a rainbow, there's lots of rainbows around at, at the moment. They always make me think of God's covenant with Noah, that testimony of his faithfulness, but they're also a picture of the glory of the one on the throne. We, we see it here, we see it in the book of Revelation, right at the end of the Bible. If you catch a glimpse of a rainbow in some form this month, do 
let it draw your mind back to Ezekiel and to the glory of the Lord. So he hears the voice of the Almighty. He sees the glory of the one on the throne. But of course we will ask, well, what does it mean? Is this just a vision for Ezekiel? Or does it tell us something about God that is real in our own experience? And I think there are two things that it, it means fairly self-evidently. First of all, it's a reminder to us, is it not, that God is still on the throne. Still ruling, still sovereign, still in control, still in charge. And that would have been so important for Ezekiel in exile. When it seemed that God's people have been defeated. And rendered powerless and everything had gone wrong and everything had been taken from them and nothing was right. And they were forgotten and... It feels as if the wheels had fallen off. We might say that the wheels are very much in place with the throne of God. But he's on the throne. And of course we know that, don't we? We know that when, when life is disappointing or disheartening, that he's still sovereign. We know it in our heads. Romans 8, 28 tells us we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Not just the good things. Not just the welcome things, but the hard things, the unwelcome diagnosis, the disturbing bank statement, the fractured relationship, the car that won't drive straight, all the disappointments and frustrations of life. He's still sovereign. We know it in our heads, but sometimes we need to feel it once again in our heart. And this God who is still on the throne for Ezekiel is still sovereign and loving and ruling for us today. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. When life feels out of control, he's still in control. And we can still cast our cares on him, knowing that he cares for us. Still on the throne. And still glorious. Here's the other great truth we can see here. That he is still wonderful and glorious and majestic and deserving of our worship. And when life seems grey and bleak, when the colour seems to have leached out of everything, when we get out of bed in the morning and look out the window and think, well, maybe I should go back to bed. When it's a struggle, when it's hard, and our heart fails within us, then what we need to do is just remind ourselves of the glory and majesty and splendour of God. That there's still a a beauty and colour in life because the Creator is so wonderful. Still deserving our, our praise and worship and adoration. And as we look to Him, as we offer Him, our worship, then our hearts are lifted and we can rediscover our sense of joy. Worship is, I believe, the right response to a sense of the glory of God. And indeed, as we look on to the very last verse, as we see Ezekiel's response to what he sees and hears, isn't that what we find? He hears the voice of God. He sees the glory of the one on the throne. We read, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. When I saw it, I fell face down. And for us as well, if we get a sense of God's glory, then we should be, in a way, falling down within our hearts, falling down in worship and wonder and awe, but also standing up, as it were, to worship and praise and offer him our loving adoration. We offer him our worship. But this God who is so glorious is also the God who speaks. 
And here's the last thing we, we see in this chapter. That when Ezekiel sees the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord, he not only falls down, but he hears the voice of the one speaking. And in fact, that's been running all the way through this chapter, hasn't it? If we look back to the beginning of chapter 1, we're told not only that the heavens were opened and Ezekiel saw visions of God, but also that the word of the Lord came to him. And this is the same God who still speaks. And as we look to see his glory, so we can be confident that the word of the Lord comes to us, that the Holy Spirit still speaks through his word, still invites us to listen. And isn't it as we spend time in the word that then as we hear God speaks to us, speaking to us that he opens our eyes to see his glory. And so we stand with Ezekiel. We are like him in exile, waiting for heaven. Far removed, perhaps, from where we should be and from the society around us. Like the exiles, our lives can be hard and challenging and discouraging at times. But also like Ezekiel, we can catch a glimpse of the glory and the power and the presence of God. We can hear him speaking to us through his word. But these things are just a foretaste of what is to come. And we look forward with longing to that day when the glory of God will be revealed in its entirety. When the Lord Jesus returns in majesty, when he wipes every tear from our arm, when there's no more death or mourning or crying or pain, when the old order of things has passed away, and when God makes all things new, and then we will stand before that sapphire throne. Then we will be gathered in with all of God's people. And we'll lift our hearts up in worship with, with the angels. And we'll cry out, holy holy, holy. And in the presence of God, redeemed by Jesus' death for us, we will find our hearts rest and peace as we're ushered into his presence, as we spend eternity before the front, where we should be, finally home after our long exile. Let's pray that we have that sense of the glory of God at the throne before which we long to stand. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the vision of your glory which you give, not only to Ezekiel but also to us. We look forward to that day when we will finally be in, in your presence with our eyes fully seeing and your glory wonderfully revealed. And as we journey through exile, as we wait for that final day, we ask you to encourage our hearts with the knowledge of the Lord and with the hope of his appearing and the promise of his glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let's respond together to God's word. So we join together in the words of the Creed, which are in the service book. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. 
He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come before you this morning offering you our worship from our hearts. We thank you that we can come just as we are, confident that you know and love us, that our sins are forgiven and that we are assured of our place with you. We pray this morning that you would give each one of us a sense of your majestic glory and splendour. That you would enable us to fix our minds on things above. And that you would give us hearts that are longing to worship and adore you. We pray for all those who are discouraged or disheartened, weighed down by life's cares and sorrows. We pray that you would draw near to them and comfort them. That you would hearten them with your loving presence. Console them with your promises. And encourage them with your hope. And we thank and praise you that in the Lord Jesus we find light and life, joy and peace, healing and grace. And we ask you to help us to walk each day closely with you, to enter more deeply into your word, Pour out our hearts to you in prayer. To lift our hearts up to you in worship. And to rejoice both in our times with you and our fellowship with all your people. Oh God, the strength of all those who put their trust in you mercifully accept our prayers and because through the weakness of our mortal nature we can do no good thing without you grant us the help of your grace that in the keeping of your commandments we may please you both in will and deed through Jesus Christ our Lord Amen gathering our prayers and praises into one, as our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So now we're going to sing again a song that fixes our minds on the, the glories of heaven. It's on page seven in the song booklets. It's there is a higher throne.
and always. 